Hello and welcome to the NevilleResearch.com video. Today I want to do something a little bit different. I want to examine some of the arguments made for Shakespeare wrote Shakespeare from the perspective of logical fallacies. And as you'll see, the argument, the apologetic arguments are really some of the worst offenders in terms of logical fallacies, incoherence, and just sort of a gobbledygook. And so the first one I want to look at is the ad hominem fallacy. And this is one of the most famous fallacies. And uh, here we have Lucy saying, that can't be true because you're an idiot. And ad hominem means to the person. And it means attacking the character, motive, or something else about a person who's making an argument instead of dealing with the argument itself. And one of the most egregious examples of this is in James Shapiro's book, Contested Will. And in Contested Will, he talks a lot about Delia Bacon. Who was Delia Bacon? Well, she was one of the first people to raise the Shakespeare authorship question. She was a leading literary figure in the mid-19th century. And she wrote a book talking about the politics in Shakespeare's plays and how they really do have a very strong political philosophy behind them. And that indicates that somebody other than William Shakespeare probably wrote them. And instead of really dealing, dealing seriously with her arguments without really you know, taking her seriously as an extraordinary thinker and literary figure of her time, James Shapiro calls her a madwoman over and over and over again. And when I say he calls her madwoman over and over again, I mean this quite literally. He says she's a crank and a madwoman. He's a madwoman, an eccentric American spinster who, who was mad. She's a madwoman in the attic. She's a mad American woman and a mad American woman, and she lost her wits, and that she was in an asylum. So over and over and over again, he's just calling her names, right? And emphasizing the fact that she's a woman, which is strange, not quite clear why, why it's so important that she's just, he wants to insult her, but wants to make over and over again the point that she's a woman. Now, I'm sure that James Shapiro would say, oh, I'm just quoting other people who are saying these things. But, you know, it's his book and he can write whatever he wants in the book. So he could take his book and uh, as a scholar, he could summarize Dealey Bacon's arguments and then talk about why he doesn't agree with them or why they're not supported by facts and evidence. But instead, we get the discussion of how she's a madwoman in the attic. So this is the kind of ad hominem stuff you'll get in Shakespeare apologetics. Now the next one I want to talk about is the straw man fallacy. So what's the straw man fallacy? It's giving the impression of refuting an opponent's argument while actually refuting an argument that was not presented by the that opponent. Now there are a lot of examples of straw man fallacies in Shakespeare apologetics but my perspective on this is a little bit different from most people's of course because I'm a Neville researcher. And so for me, almost all of Shakespeare apologetics is straw man stuff because they are arguing against authorship candidates who aren't correct. So the Earl of Oxford, or Christopher Marlowe, these people died very early. They couldn't possibly have written the works of Shakespeare. And there are other reasons why they're not appropriate candidates. So almost every argument made by Shakespeare apologists is against these candidates and none of them apply to Henry Neville. So that's sort of a special thing for me, from my perspective, but I, to me, almost all of Shakespeare apologetics is just straw man, straw man nonsense and has no relation to anything I'm doing. Now the next one, Tyler Cowen, the great, uh, the economist and the great blogger, talks about something called mood affiliation. So what's mood affiliation? It's where people find a mood or attitude and then find disparate views which match that mood. And he calls this the fallacy of mood affiliation. And they justify those views by the mood. 
So this is an interesting, interesting concept. And this article in Vox.com, why some people think Shakespeare didn't write Shakespeare, I think it's best described as mood affiliation. So I, I want to actually read this. Uh, she writes, and there's a lot to gain from accepting that fact. Sure, you lose the grand, exciting conspiracy theory, but you get instead is proof that you can reach the pinnacle of human achievement without enormous inherited wealth and privilege. You can come from nowhere and still write something that people will love and study and invent conspiracy theories over 400 years after your death. So the argument is that it's such a wonderful and beautiful idea that Shakespeare wrote Shakespeare. It must be true. Something like this. But, you know, the thing about history is that history is about facts and evidence and what actually happened. And whether we like what happened or, or don't like what happened or get to make pretty stories about what happened or not, it really doesn't affect what actually happened. So this whole argument of classism or some sort of snobbery in, in dealing with Shakespeare authorship it's just some sort of weird mood affiliation. The question of who wrote the works of Shakespeare is a historical factual question, and it must be resolved with historical factual research. It has nothing to do with what we, we want the answer to be or what our mood makes our mood feel happy for the answer to be. The question is what really happened. And that's what research does. It investigates that question. Respect my authority, Cartman says. And this fallacy is the appeal to authority. It's really quite simple. The idea is that there are experts, scholars who study the works of Shakespeare, and we as non-experts, as non-professionals in that field, must defer to their judgment on who wrote the works of Shakespeare. And this is sort of an interesting fallacy because in many cases, we probably should defer to experts. We're not really in a position to uh, do our own research into climate science or the efficacy of and safety profile vaccines. It's not something that's open to individual research by non-experts, but it, Shakespeare's not like that. Anybody can read the works of Shakespeare. Anybody can read the biographies written about Shakespeare. Anybody can read other works written in the period. So it's really open to anybody. And that's why it's really quite amazing that we have such bad arguments made by the Shakespeare apologists. You think that these so-called experts would be a little bit more careful in what they say, since everyone can see that the things they're saying are ridiculous. And that's sort of the point of this video. So I do think we should look to authorities in some cases, but when the authorities fail us, we've got to use our own good judgment. And I'm going to show some more examples where that's very necessary. Circular reasoning is one of the most common fallacies used in the defense of Shakespeare wrote Shakespeare. And what does circular reasoning mean? It means the premises presume openly or covertly the very conclusion that is to be demonstrated. So it's sort of assuming the conclusion of your argument as the basis for your argument. And the most egregious example of this, and I've seen this over and over again, relates to the dedication to Venus and Adonis. Because this is the first thing in 1593 ever published under Shakespeare's name. And it has William Shakespeare down here, and then up here, it's dedicated to the Earl of Southampton. And the question is, what's the evidence that Shakespeare had any connection whatsoever with the Earl of Southampton? There is no independent evidence for this connection. So the question is, well, what's the evidence for this? And then the question is, well, there's no literary evidence of Shakespeare ever writing anything. There's no uh, documents left. There's no letters he wrote. There's no evidence of any kind of letters he ever wrote to anyone. And we have his signatures that don't really look like he knew how to write his own name. So the question is, of course, 
you know, why? What's going on here? What's the what's the explanation for these for these disparate facts? And the answer is, well, we have a we have a letter right here that he wrote. And he must have had a connection with the Earl of Southampton because he dedicated a book to the Earl of Southampton. And it's sort of this ridiculous circular argument. He must have known the Southampton because he dedicated a book to Southampton, or he must have been able to write the plays and poems because he wrote them. It's the circular argument that doesn't engage with anything else that we can research or, or know about or verify through independent means. So there's a lot of examples of this kind of thing. Assuming that his genius based upon the works that he wrote as a way to prove he wrote the works. Well, he was a genius after all. So he could have done this or could have done that or could have learned Italian because he knew Latin or whatever people are trying to claim. They're saying, well, he was a genius after all. But the only reason they have to think he was a genius is because of they are assuming that he wrote the works in the first place. So this kind of circular argument is very popular and you'll see it crop up all the time in, a, in Shakespeare apologetics. Now, guilt by association is one of the most pernicious forms of argument, and I've seen this popping up a lot recently, and it's asserting by a relevant association and often by appeal to emotion, I think this is an important point here, that qualities of one thing are inherently qualities of another. And I, I think it's best just to look at this example. Oliver Cam wrote this article in Quillette. And it's really it just shows you how empty the Shakespeare apologetics is. So the main point of this article is to find people who doubt Shakespeare, find Oxfordians or other people who who think that Shakespeare didn't write Shakespeare, research their background and use that as an attack point against, I don't know, somehow to defend that Shakespeare wrote Shakespeare. So he's researched somebody and found that they doubted they were 9-11 doubters or somebody else doubted Einstein or Darwin or something. And it's this sort of, it's like the lowest form of argument you could possibly have. Because if you have strong arguments, of course, you don't need to do any of this stuff. You just make your really strong and conclusive arguments. And it's sort of a form of ad hominem when you're attacking the person, but you're not even attacking the person. You're attacking somebody else and then suggesting that because somebody else has some weird belief, therefore your position is correct. It's completely ridiculous. And this kind of pernicious form of argument just so shows how empty these people are. They've got nothing to defend their position. And so all they have is this sort of attack. Now, I obviously am uh, somebody who thinks that Shakespeare didn't write the works attributed to him. And I'm actively doing research in this area. And none of these things apply to me at all, of course, and don't apply to most people who are engaged in this kind of research. But it's sort of this guilt by association attempt is like the last thing you do. You've got no, no other argument. You have no way to defend your position. And so you start finding people to attack. And it's really uh, ridiculous. and just shows what kind of people the apologists are these days. Okay, so here's our final fallacy, the red herring fallacy. And... We have up here, look, a distraction, something that misleads or distracts from a relevant or important question. So red herring fallacy is really just trying to distract everybody so that the actual issues are forgotten. And this is something that people do, obviously, when they don't have good arguments. They just want to distract everybody. And Jonathan Bate here in his book, The Genius of Shakespeare, really epitomizes this, this fallacy. I don't want to get too deep into this because I don't actually think he, he wrote this seriously. I think he's trying to be campy with this. 
uh, maybe a little ironic or something. But um, he writes that haunting in the context of Shakespeare immediately makes one think of the ghost of Hamlet's father. So he, out of the blue, in a discussion of Shakespeare authorship, brings up Hamlet's father. And then he starts into a discussion of a Freudian explanation. So he's using sort of Freudian analysis on Shakespeare authorship doubters. And he's saying that Shakespeare is the haunting father. The writer is the haunted Hamlet. And that American, right, American people want to throw off their English literary patrimony and uh, because they know that Shakespeare is just so superior, but they cannot kill Shakespeare. So they have to kill his name for it is a name that a literary father exercises authority. So we want to, we have some Oedipal complex with Shakespeare where he's our father and we want to kill him because we want to marry Anne Hathaway, not the actress, but Shakespeare's wife, but something like this. So it doesn't really make any sense, obviously. And, uh, you know, Jonathan Bates, a very intelligent uh, person, and he knows this doesn't make sense. So what he's doing here is just creating a distraction, right? He doesn't have good arguments for why Shakespeare wrote Shakespeare. He doesn't have good evidence. So he brings up this Freudian analysis about how Americans want to kill Shakespeare because they just don't like his influence. And it's doubly absurd because, of course, everyone who doubts Shakespeare's authorship just wants to replace him with a different English person. So nothing is accomplished. So it doesn't really make, none of this makes sense at all. Anyway, those are the logical fallacies I want to share with you. And I really hope you will like this video and click subscribe and tell your friends. And uh, thanks for coming by.